Today's scripture reading is uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. It is found in page 1892 in your pew Bible. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must be, must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over the, those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. Let's pray as we open God's word. Lord, thank you for the joy it is to be together and to recognize your calling on our lives. For those who will be installed today in these roles who've agreed to serve, we ask your blessing and for those of us that they will serve in this coming year, help us to bless and support and allow them to serve in the ways they've been called. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, today is our board installation, the time we set aside to pray for and commission those who will serve the church in this year in roles of leadership. So since that's our focus, I thought it'd be a good idea to use today's sermon to talk about some of those roles. This sermon will be the first in what will become a recurring but intermittent series called, How Does the Church Work? Obviously, we can't describe everything in the church in one sermon, so we'll return to this series in additional installments from time to time, sooner or later. But today, we're gonna talk about lay roles of servant leadership, especially elders, deacons, trustees, and officers. And we're going to talk about them in two ways. Number one, what does the scripture say about these roles? And number two, how do they function within our congregation? The first thing to know is that only two of these roles are mentioned by name in the Bible, elder and deacon. Trustees and board officers are roles common to many congr modern congregations, but we invented those titles and responsibilities. Today we'll focus mostly on one of the scriptural injunctions directed at elders. In future installments, we'll look about scriptures uh, aimed at deacons. There are several passages in the New Testament and even some in the Old Testament that are directed to people with the title elders. But today, we're gonna look at one that comes from probably the most famous leader of the early church. But what he was most famous for was not being an elder, but an apostle. We could say the apostle of those specifically chosen and sent by Jesus. Today's instructions come from an elder and an apostle named Peter. But the way he opens this section addressing elders tells us something important about the nature of this role. First Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. When it came to the first century church, Peter was possibly the most well-known Christian in the world, especially within the church itself. He was sort of the unofficial leader among the 12 disciples, if you read the Gospels. He was one of the three disciples who was closest to Jesus and experienced some unique events, Peter, James, and John. God worked through Peter on Pentecost when some 3,000 people were converted to faith. 
It was Peter, not Paul, who was involved in the conversion of the first Gentile. Even Paul would go on to call Peter one of the pillars of the church. Peter was easily the most recognized and revered leader in the church at that time. And yet, when he opens his address to the elders everywhere, how did he identify himself? Not, I command you as an apostle, or even, I order you as one of the original disciples and kind of the main one. That's not what he says. Instead, he says, to the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. By calling himself a fellow elder, he's saying, I'm telling you this because I'm one of you. I have the same responsibility and I face the same challenges. So as a fellow elder, listen, listen to what I'm saying. I have a little experience in this area. He doesn't act as if he's somehow bringing himself down to their level. Instead, he's calling all of them up to the same level, the high calling of servant leader in the mold of Jesus. It's like he's saying, you think my role is important as apostle? Your role, our shared role as elders, is no less significant. It's essential to the health of the church. So is being an elder a big deal? Yes. Since when? Since right after Jesus. But there's something else that binds Peter and his readers together. Peter calls himself a witness of Christ's sufferings and also one who will share in the glory to be revealed. What does he mean by a witness to Christ's sufferings? Well, he could mean that he was an eyewitness to Jesus' death. But the truth is, almost all the apostles in the Gospels abandoned Jesus. Only John was present there at the crucifixion. Peter knows that Jesus died, but he didn't see it. It He could mean witness of Christ's sufferings like he testifies, he witnesses about Christ's sufferings. He does that in this very letter and in all of his preaching. But most likely what he means when he calls himself a witness of Christ's suffering is that he shares in them. He has experienced them himself. In this same letter, he talks about how we as Christians participate in the sufferings of Christ. How Christians experience some of what Jesus did and the hardships he experienced as he tried to obey God. The context here points to that idea. Witness of Christ's sufferings is coupled with share in the glory to be revealed. If we share in his sufferings, we will also share in the glory to be revealed. This week, uh, Marshall was working on his ordination papers. You have to write all this stuff, you know. Hopefully, uh, if all goes as planned, he has his final meeting in April, and then sometime this summer, he will have his ordination. That's something I think we can be excited about and proud for. But he... But he he came to me this week and he said, hey, there's one of the questions I don't get. Okay, which one is it? You know, I've been through the process. And he says, it's something about describe the representative ministry of Christ. And it was funny that he should ask me that question because some 20 plus years ago, I had exactly the same question. I came to that and I don't know what this, what does that mean? The representative ministry of Christ. That's a term that I'd never heard. So I went to somebody who'd been ordained before me and they told me what I told Marshall, which is the representative ministry of Christ is the idea that as a minister, you stand in the place of Christ. You represent Jesus to the church. You represent Jesus to the world. And so how does that work? What does that mean to you? He's like, oh, okay, it's exactly what I said. Oh, okay. You know, then we go fell it. The same thing happens over and over again. So Marshall and I agreed they need to change the wording of the question. But anyway, um, do we understand that when we serve in Christ's name, this is not just for ordained ministers. This is for all believers. When we serve in Christ's name, we stand in his place. Jesus gives us the right, indeed the command, to do the kind of things he's done. One of the best examples, and we'll have this a little bit later in the service, is serving communion. To me, it's a great privilege and honor and grace to receive the body and blood of Christ in communion and remember all that that means, but it's even more of an honor to serve it. Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want you to just receive it. I want you to stand there and give it to others in my name. Are you worthy to do that? Yes, you are. Yes, you are, because Christ has claimed you. In his advice, the first thing Peter does about elders is to define an elder. Verse 2, he says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Now, the idea of a leader among God's people being a shepherd dates back even to the Old Testament. 
Originally, if you remember, God was seen as the shepherd of the people. The most prominent example is probably Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. A little less well-known but still beautiful is Isaiah 40. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have, that have young. Jesus picked up on this idea of being a shepherd in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So as shepherds, what are elders supposed to do? Well, what does a shepherd do for the sheep? When they're sick or injured, the shepherd takes care of them. When they're in danger, she protects them. When they're scattered all over, the shepherd gathers them together and unifies them, keeps them as one flock. Those are the same things that an elder does in the life of the church. And why does the elder do that? Peter gives us three wrong motives for serving as an elder and one right one. Verse 2, not because you must, but because you're willing to serve as God wants you to be. We do not require or coerce anyone into serving as an elder. I've been on several nominating teams, and I can tell you on their behalf, we wish we could make people do it, but we can't, okay? The, the congregation nominates people, and the nominating team narrows that down and invites people to be, and some people say, this time is not right for me, or this role is not right for me. And unfortunately, we have to keep looking, you know, <laughs> but I'm saying, because a lot of times we see gifts in people that they don't see in themselves, but we don't require anyone. Everyone who serves, serves because they've chosen to accept the call. Peter also says, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. The idea of people exploiting the church for money was just as big a problem in the first century as it is today. It has always been the case that sometimes people come with selfish motives, especially in roles of leadership. And Peter says, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're about. Verse 3, not lording it over those who entrusted to you, entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. The truth is, sometimes people serve not because they're greedy for money, but because they're greedy for control. They want to be in charge. They want to be a boss. But Peter seems to think that those people have got the wrong idea about the nature of leadership. It's like he's saying, we, we don't need any more bosses. We need you to be a leader. And being a leader doesn't mean giving orders or making all the decisions. It means setting an example. It's not about telling people what to do. It's about showing people what to do. You remember Psalm 23? Do you know that whole psalm? How did the psalmist describe God's shepherding style? The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And the next part's about still waters. And how does God get us to the still waters? The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He drives me to the still waters. Get over there, you sorry. No, that's, that's not what it says. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He herds me to the still waters. All right, all you knuckleheads, don't ask questions, just go. You know, that's not, no. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He leads me to the still waters. In other words, God goes first, shows us the way, and we choose to follow. That's the nature of Christian leadership. Have you ever had a stormy time in your heart or in your mind or in your spirit? And just being around a person who has still waters gives you peace. It's like they're lending you their stillness. They're loaning you their faith. If we follow Christ, we will end up, we will make our home by still waters. We'll also go through the valley of the shadow of death, okay? That's going to happen too. But if we follow Christ, we're going to end up at still waters, and we can do that for one another. A leader is not someone who makes you do something. A leader is someone who shows you and somehow helps you want to do something. The simplest example of a leader is, how do you know if someone's a leader? If people follow them. If people follow them, they're a leader. That's how it works. 
That's why Peter will go on to call Jesus the chief shepherd. Peter and the other apostles and elders and ministers are merely under shepherds. Jesus is the chief shepherd. I had one friend who said, well, really, it's uh, Jesus is the shepherd, the real shepherd, and ministers are sheepdogs. I understand the metaphor. It's a little insulting, but I get it. I know what you're saying. Uh, but I think it's about right. I think it's about right. So finally, Peter gives us the real reason that elders are to serve. Verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. What is glory? It's a word we throw around a lot of times. In scriptural terms, it means one of two things. Either it means light, like a bright, shining, blazing light. Remember the shepherds in the Luke Christmas story? And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. You know, so it's a bright light. Or it means fame or renown, being well-known, received and celebrated with honor. It's that second definition that's operating here. Why do we serve? Why do we willingly turn away from exploitation and the need for control and choose instead to humble ourselves and serve others in Christ's name and in Christ's style? Why do we serve? Because Jesus sees it and loves it. Who are we famous with? With him, with the chief shepherd. That's the crown of glory. We don't do it so that Jesus will love us. He already loves us and has proven that over and over again. We do it because it's our way of returning love to him. It pleases him for us to serve others with a whole heart. That's the crown of glory. In a little while, right after this, we're going to call forward this year's elders and deacons and trustees and officers so that they can be installed. We can pray for them and encourage them in their roles. But I wonder, as we've been talking together this morning, as our elders for this year sit among us and they hear about this high calling that they have accepted, I wonder if they're nervous. With all these expectations, being willing and open-hearted and serving with pure motives and turning away from control and choosing instead to lead and serve sacrificially, that can be kind of intimidating, right? Can anyone really fulfill that calling on your own? No. The truth is, none of us have what it takes to really represent Jesus. But you haven't been called to do what you can do on your own. Each of you have been called for what God can do through you. That's what the church needs. That's what the world needs. And if we're talking about what God can do through you, you can be all that we need and more with God's help. So that's a word to the leaders, people who've chosen to serve in these roles of servant leadership. But what about those of us who will be served in this coming year? How can you help your elder be successful? I can think of at least three things. In a sermon, it's always three things. Three things. Number one, share your needs. We cannot help meet your needs if you don't tell us what they are. It's real, real simple. I like to joke that Jesus healed many people in many different ways. Sometimes he touched them. Sometimes he made mud and put it on them. Sometimes he talked to them. Sometimes they weren't even in the same county. All different ways. But there's never a story where Jesus is walking along, and one day he says, I sense somewhere that someone's in trouble. You know, that's, that's not one of the stories. They came to him and asked for help, told him what they needed, and he helped them. We can't meet needs if we don't share our needs. I always say everybody wants the prayer list, but nobody's willing to be on it. Okay, we can't have a prayer list if we won't tell each other our needs. So if you go in the hospital, for goodness sakes, tell somebody. Text your elder. Call the church office. Have your loved one tell us what's happening. If you're going through a time of crisis, if you're going through anxiety, a time of need, let us know. It's not an imposition. It's not improper. It's what shepherds are supposed to do. But we can't do it unless we know. Okay? So number one, share your needs. Number two, getting more controversial as we go along. Don't try to co-opt them. 
What do I mean by that? In every group of people, a church is no exception, we're going to have disagreements, we're going to have problems, we're going to have issues. It's bound to happen. There's no way around it, okay? And I don't think that's wrong, I don't think that's inappropriate, and I don't think it's wrong to express those things. But there are healthy and unhealthy ways to share our concerns. And what sometimes happens in churches, and often this happens really from a good motive, because we want to do it in a least wave making way as possible but we say to ourselves okay I'm upset so what should I do I'll tell you what I'll do I'm going to pull the board chair aside or I'm going to find my elder and pull them aside and tell them all the stuff pour it dump it all on them and then I'm going to say but I don't want this don't tell them it was me you take this problem of mine and go advocate for it and then another person does that and a third person does that, and a fifth person, and a tenth person, and nobody wants to really say that they're upset, so who's upset? People are upset, and the elder, or the board officer, or the deacon is supposed to somehow shoulder all those things. That is not healthy. That is not scriptural. That's not how it's supposed to work. I'm not saying we shouldn't have concerns. I'm not saying we shouldn't voice them, but let your concerns be your concerns. Maybe you can come and talk to all the elders at once. If it's a big enough deal for you to be upset about, it's a big enough deal to you attach to your name to it. That's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work. And I'm telling you, if we don't do that, if we do this co-opting instead, that is what burns leaders out the fastest. That's what drains us the quickest. Sometimes it happens in churches, but we've got to break that cycle if it's happening in our community. Share your needs. Don't co-opt them. And thirdly, pray for them. Pray for them. Understand that shepherds need shepherding too. I had one of the craziest experiences a couple of weeks ago. Um, the adult child of one of our members email, that I don't know emailed me and said, um, hey, can I come by and talk to you sometime? And I was like, sure. This person's parent is a little older, and I thought, well, maybe... I've never met them, but maybe they're concerned about their parent and they know that I know them or something. Or maybe, you know, sometimes people just need a minister and that's the only minister they've heard of or something. Anyway, so this woman comes in and sits down and I said, well, how can I help you? And she said, well, um, I happen to know because my parent uh, went into ministry later in life that nobody ever asks the minister, how are you doing? So sometimes I feel an urging or a nudge from God to do that, and your name was just on my heart, and so I just want to come and say, how are you doing, and can I pray for you? And I said, well, guess what? You came at the right time. <laughs> I'm going through some stuff in my life, and it was just so, it's like I was needing someone, specifically not necessarily somebody from our congregation, but just a person of faith that I could really confide in, and the Lord dropped this person in my lap. This person's parent doesn't know they were there. God told them to do that, and they did. And I'm telling you, it makes a difference. Everybody needs shepherding, and the chief shepherd wants us to all support one another. So how can you support the people who serve in roles of leadership? Share your needs. Don't try to co-opt them and pray for them. Find out what you can do to support them. If we can do those things, there's no telling the kind of health and wholeness and strength and healing that can happen in the community of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today and for the privilege of serving in your family. Somehow, you count us worthy to represent you. You think you can work not only in but even through us to continue your purpose in this world. And we've seen it happen before. So give us the faith to trust that it can happen through us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. So now we come to our time of installation. We come to this glad and solemn moment in which the congregation recognizes the gifts, God's gift of elders, deacons, trustees, and officers to serve the church in Christ's ministry. All ministry is a gift from Jesus Christ, who is the chief minister, the great high priest 
of the entire people of God. Through the action of the Holy Spirit, Christ's ministry of reconciling, healing, teaching, and serving is the basis of all ministries. While the whole people of God through baptism is commissioned to share in this task, the church from earliest times has set aside some persons, set some persons apart with prayer to serve in designated roles. Elders. An eldership has been established through which those named as elders serve together in a shared responsibility of congregational leadership. The responsibility of the eldership is to teach and express the nature of the church and the spirit of Christian living in word and deed, to give wise counsel to individual members and to the congregation as a whole in the face of perplexities of its life together, to represent with discipline clarity the church's understanding of the significance of communion at the Lord's table, to share in positions of church leadership on the church board, to guard in all things the unity and peace of Christ's holy church. In 2023, six people will serve as elders. As I call your name, please come forward and form a line in front of the table facing the screens, which you'll need in just a minute. Our elders for this year will be Mark Luera, Christy Williams, Danny Amos, Sherry Ward, Marcy Griffith, and our chair of elders, Pam Kirkland. Deacons. A diaconate has been established through which those designated as deacons serve together in shared responsibility of church leadership. Together, they are those who assist in worship and particularly in the ministry of baptism and the Lord's Supper, take shared responsibility to serve on the board, guiding the church's collective expressions of the gospel, and fulfill designated administrative responsibility in the ordered life and mission of the church. The following persons are called by this congregation to serve as deacons in 2020. 23. I'd also ask you to come forward at this time. Kurt Riffle, Audie Bradshaw, Craig Richardson, Kim Ward, Janet Warren, or excuse me, Jeanette Warren, Kenneth Boone, Leticia Leone, Lydia Leone, Joel Williams, Nancy Rogers, and our chair of deacons for this year, Jeff Tobin. Trustees. Since the spiritual ministry of the church takes place in the context of the wider world, the church also calls trustees to oversee administrative functions. Together, they are those who act as the legal signatories in contractual business matters under the direction of the board, maintain records of contractual and legal matters regarding the church, offer wise counsel to the board regarding legal matters, take shared responsibility to serve on the board. Our trustees for this year, and oh, I don't have this written down, but I think it's right, is Mark Hendricks, Corky uh, Ellis, and Grover Brillhart. Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we also, I didn't write it on here, sorry. Uh, we also have a junior deacon. We don't always have this, but we have that this year. And so serving for the first time is Charlie White. I'd ask you to come forward. Officers, God graces the church with leaders equipped for its work by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Today we rejoice in the blessings of God represented in the officers who've been called to Christ's service and who now acknowledge this calling by dedication of their lives to Christ's servant ministry. The following persons are called by this congregation to serve as officers of the board in 2023. As I call your name, please come forward. Our board chair this year is Susan Stamper, vice chair Kim Ward, Secretary Malia Turk, Treasurer Danny Housewright, Parliamentarian Jeff Tobin. Some people, as you see, are serving double duty. Okay. So I'll ask all of those who've come forward at this time to turn around this way so you can see from the screens what you'll need to read in just a moment. Let us remember the model of leadership provided by our Lord, who came not to be served, but to serve. And who said to his disciples, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. I'd ask you to respond. I now ask the congregation to join these elected leaders in a covenant affirmation. I'd ask you to stand and join in this affirmation. Reaffirming our faith in Christ, we gladly receive these servant leaders in our life together. 
we covenant to support them with our prayers, encouragement, and respect. We celebrate with thanksgiving the shared responsibilities for Christ's ministry that is ours as the church. Praise be to God. And so now, um, if I can switch to my lapel mic, please. Um, we're going to have a time there. And so I'd ask the leaders here to place a hand on someone next to you. Uh, and around you, if you're able to, you can place a hand on someone in the laying on of hands in this time. Let's pray. Lord, we count it a great privilege to be chosen by you at all, but especially to be chosen by you to serve. Whatever inadequacies we fear in our hearts and in our minds, whatever parts of ourselves we worry about or are not proud of, we know that you've come to save and work through all that we are. So help us to trust not in our own abilities or even in each other, but to trust in you. And through that, help us to trust each other. And through that, help us to trust even ourselves. We ask all this in Jesus' name.